I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, let me know if the volume is very low. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, I'm going to give the top arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture. It's going to be so thorough, so convincing, that it'll outnumber any other video that you will watch. I'm going to be very exhaustive in Scripture. A lot of people do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. There are people who believe they will go through the tribulation. Other people argue that there is no such thing as a rapture. Other people believe that there is a rapture, but that it will be sometime at the end of the tribulation. Other people believe that there is no such thing, and there are some people who might be amillennialists. And for amillennialists, they would believe that instead of the kingdom coming down at the end where Jesus Christ reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords, after we get uh, raptured and undergo the tribulation... They believe that the kingdom is currently operating and God is reigning right now in his kingdom, which is complete madness and it does not make sense. So maybe not all, uh, so I would say that not all, all millennialists would believe that, but some of them do. So this video is going to be very thorough and exhaustive and convincing. Amen. Now I'm going to point out also why certain arguments you're going to hear, and you're going to hear them online all over. You're going to hear them in churches. Some of you out there might think that, well, I'm scared about going through the tribulation. Some of you claim, I want to believe that there is a rapture before the tribulation, but I just find it very difficult to believe in that. I'm going to give a lot of scriptural verses. The Bible is the answer and the evidence. There are too many people out there throwing their opinions and throwing out verses. But I'm going to show you the verses where you have to look up yourself. You can't just believe me. You look at the verse, you study, and then let the scriptures determine the truth. Uh, God promised that the scriptures is of no private interpretation. He promised that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. So you shouldn't be afraid of that. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Hence, it is your job to open that verse... Check me out, because like I would say in my other videos, I could be lying yeah, to you, yeah, okay? Yeah, so it's important to do that, and then you look at the verses yourself, and then let the Holy Spirit show you and reveal to you. Now, uh, I have uh, so many arguments and pages, it could probably number to 100 arguments. Now, obviously, I don't have time to go through 100 arguments. It's very thorough against people who argue there is no pre-tribulation rapture. I have like probably a hundred arguments against it. It's very exhaustive. I started a series on that one. I didn't get to finish it. Why? Because it was starting to bore the uh, bore uh, the audience was getting bored actually. So then I realized it was too deep. So then I just stopped. I just stopped. So you don't want me go all out. We'll probably be here for five hours. I'm going to make it very simple. I'm going to make it very simple yet extremely thorough enough. There is a doctrine which we call dispensationalism. Some of you might ask, what is dispensationalism? Dispensationalism simply meaning, this is an amateur term, okay, not the technical term, basically that we divide verses in the Bible to the right group of people in right time periods. Why do we do that? Because a lot of people claim that the verses apply to them. But not all verses apply to you. Sometimes you have to realize that verse might apply to a different person, to a different time period. That's why there's a lot of wrong doctrine. That's why people think they'll go through the tribulation. Other people argue they have to do works for salvation. Other people say that if uh, you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, but you take the mark of the beast then uh, you're going to hell because your work and your faith is not strong enough. And then you'll get John MacArthur and then T Tim LaHaye and uh, Ken Hoven and some other uh, weirdos who will say that, no, it's okay, you can, 
be saved. It's by faith alone. You don't have to do the work of resisting the mark of the beast. There is still a way. Tim LaHaye went so as far as to say you have the seal of God and the mark of the beast. <laughs> so that's just really messed up. So uh, that's why there's so much mess and confusion. Uh, people, especially online, is so bad. People are watching so many stuff online. It's confusion. Now, you need to get out of online and look at the book. Amen. The reason why I go online is because it's so confusing out there. I want to cut down the wolves, cut down the wrong doctrine, and make something clear. Yeah. And be that shining little light in that garbage hellhole mess called the online world. So that's why I still try to fight for where I'm at online. Uh, I hope that the people will keep this video high and share it with so many other people. That Amen. way truth can spread. Amen. There's a lot of heresy out there, especially these times that we live in. There's a lot of fear and concern. And people are really studying about the Antichrist and tribulation yeah. and the oh, mark of the beast. A lot of people are afraid of getting... <clears throat> because they think that that is the mark of the beast yeah. right now. And some people who did get it, they think they're going to hell. Yeah. That's it. We don't believe in that. Amen. In dispensationalism, Amen. we divide, like I told you. Yeah. Okay. So then, here's the uh, Old Testament right here. And then, Jesus died on the cross. Amen. And then, we undergo the New Testament. And that's where the Christian church comes in, right? So then, the, trist, the Christian church comes in. We can all agree there's a difference with Old Testament, New Testament. That's Amen. why... We, whether you, you believe it or not, you are a closet dispensationalist because you believe in dividing at least the two testaments. Right. Right. So a lot of people don't <laughs> That's think good, that. Brother. So you are a closet dispensationalist. Whether Amen. You believe it or not. Amen. So then here is the church age. The church age. Then we undergo the tribulation. And that's where everyone's afraid of the mark of the beast and 666. And then after the tribulation, we argue that's when God's kingdom is going to come down on the earth. And then he will reign for a thousand years. Now, a lot of people might pull up this argument, that argument. Well, what about this? What about that? I don't believe in those right four divisions of time periods. To make things simple, what I would like to request is... You will please watch our video, Amazing Dispensationalism, Amen. from Genesis to Revelation. You can also go to our YouTube channel, and there's a playlist section. Go to our playlist section, you'll easily find Dispensationalism, and there are tons of videos. And it's simplified in a way for your understanding. So I'm not going to go through every argument on Dispensationalism. My argument here is to prove a rapture before the tribulation. That's all I'm going to do right here. In order to prove that, that's why I introduced about dispensationalism so you can get a better idea. And then I'm going to start going, giving off the proofs. So pre-tribulation rapture, some of you have heard of that before and I mentioned that in the intro. What does that mean? Simply pre, so before the tribulation, Amen. you get Rapture. It's that simple. Now, what are the proof texts for this? First of all, we have to understand that there is no doubt a rapture. The people will argue there's no such word as rapture in the Bible. No, look at 1 Thessalonians 4. Rapture is in the Bible. Rapture is in the Bible. They'll say, no, there's no such thing as the word rapture in the Bible. No, there is. But you've got to understand this, is that when we use the word rapture, there's another meaning for it in English. It's not the exact word itself. But rapture, it comes from Latin where people realize it or not. Raptor, which means snatching up, yeah. caught away. Yeah. Kind of like a thief, so to speak. Yeah. So there's a catching up or snatching. And that is very plain from scripture that God catches up living Living people, like you and I, not dead. So we're not talking about a resurrection. We're talking about rapture. Okay? People who are alive will be caught up to heaven. Now, if you want to make it plain, look at 1 Thessalonians 4. The Bible says in verse 17, Then we which are alive, see that? And remain, 
shall be what? Caught up together with them in the where? Clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And what does it say? So shall we ever be with the Lord. See, you go up with the Lord in heaven and you are caught up. Now that's plain as day. If you want to say there's no such thing as rapture in your Bible, these people, with all due respect, are lying to you. The word rapture is in your Bible. It may not be like these exact letters saying rapture, but that the meaning catching up is in there. It's plain as day. It's like the, there's no such word as Bible right. in your Bible, but scriptures is mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. And Bible means scripture. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Now, so there's no doubt a rapture. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So then, there are people who will have to admit and confess, okay, there is a rapture, I believe in that. There's a rapture. But they'll argue that this rapture is sometime in the tribulation or after. That's what they teach. Hence, there's a doctrine called post tribulation rapture. What that means is sometime after the tribulation, there is a rapture. Some will argue, no, it's not sometime after, it's a mid, okay? Me, I say whatever. Point is, there's a rapture in the tribulation, and it can be after or middle, doesn't matter to me. But this is their scriptural proof. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24, in verse 31. And he, that's Jesus, shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So notice right here that it seems like that God's elect get raptured up to heaven. But this is when? This is after. You'll notice in verse 29, 29 immediately after the tribulation. So this is their proof text for a post Tribulation rapture. Some will use this as a mid-tribulation rapture too. Don't matter. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15. I mentioned that before. I hope your hand's over there. The answer is very simple. Dispensationalism believes in dividing. Yes, the Bible does talk about a rapture sometime in the tribulation, but the Bible also talks about a rapture before the tribulation. What does that mean? Simple. You rightly divide the raptures. There's a rapture for tribulation saints. So here are tribulation saints, and then there's a rapture for the Christian saints here. It's that simple. It's like there's a testament for Jews and a testament for Christians. Old Testament, New Testament. That's simple. So... How do we know that that is the case? Well, the reason why that is the case is because 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this division. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then look at verse uh, 51. Uh, so verses 50 through 55. If you look at verses 50 through 55, that's the famous passage talking about the rapture. Now, if that passage talks about the rapture, then how is it going to be divided? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall what? All be made alive. There is what? Verse 21 is talking about resurrection of the dead. Okay? What's going on within this? So there's no doubt the context is the rapture here. If it's talking about the rapture, what does the Bible say in verse 23? But every man in his what? Order. Own order. There's an order to this. Ah, an order. What is it? Notice right here the Bible says Christ the first fruits. So first is Jesus Christ. We know that when he resurrected, he went up. To heaven as well. And by the way, 
If you look at Matthew 27, Old Testament saints, the Old Testament saints, the Jews, Old Testament Jews, were resurrected along with Christ. So there's your first one. And then if you compare that with Ephesians chapter uh, 4, you're going to find out that they went up to heaven. Jesus Christ uh, set the captives free yeah. and took them up to heaven. But the point is, is that first we have a first group of people, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, so there's another group. Right. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Are you, do you belong to Christ? Yeah. We're called, the Christian church is the body yeah. of Christ. Right. So we belong to Christ. We're called Christians, see, taking after Christ. For some of you who didn't know, it actually meant little Christ, Christians. So see, that's no doubt us, the Christians. Uh -huh. So that's two, but look at verse 24, then what? Cometh come come the, the end. So then the come end. So then people will come out, the end is here, the end is here, the tribulation is here, the end is here. Ah, they also have their order of the resurrection as well. So notice, read again if you don't believe me, 21, 22, 23, 24. Read those verses. It's, the context is about the resurrection. It's talking about the rapture when we look at verse 50 through 56. So this resurrection and rapture has what? An order. Every man who, gets part, who participates in this. What? We see the three groups. Christ the first fruits. You can see that perfectly matching with Matthew 27. Old Testament saints going up with Jesus Christ. Compare that with Ephesians 4. They go up to heaven. And we know Jesus went up to heaven too after his resurrection. Secondly, Hello. you see uh, the Christians. They that are Christ. And then third one, the end. The tribulation, they also have their own rapture. So the Bible already told you that. Well, I don't believe that. That's just so hard to believe several different raptures. Then you don't believe Enoch got raptured? You don't believe Elijah got raptured? You don't believe Jesus Christ himself raptured literally up to yeah, heaven yeah, alive? Yeah. You already got three raptures. Why? Do, what do you mean you have a hard time believing multiple raptures? It's all over in your Bible. So, and 1 Corinthians 15 is plain. They have an order and a system here of this rapture. Okay, so there's no doubt that there is multiple. So, when we look at these passages, look at Matthew 24 again, and then I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Keep your hand at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Here's something you have to think about. Their very own proof text, Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is the favorite proof text, which we read before about, hey, there's a rap the rapture, yes, but it's after the tribulation. So Christians are not going to be raptured before the tribulation. That don't make sense. No, what they fail to realize is when they looked at Matthew 24, Jesus talked about this rapture. But what did he describe it as? In Matthew 24, Jesus said in verse 26, uh, verse 26, look at verse 26. And he's talking about this rapture, okay? That's after the tribulation. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. So the Bible saying this is not a secret, okay? This is not private. This is not something mysterious, okay? Mystery means a secret that wasn't revealed before, right? So that's what the Bible says. The Bible says it's what? It's public. Because at verse 30, verse 30, notice that all the people in the earth, they see him publicly. All right. So then this mystery secret private does not apply here. It does not apply here. It has to be public. This is very public. Now, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. People who believe a rapture after the tribulation, they're going to say, 1 Corinthians 15 
is talking about the tribulation rapture. There's nothing in here that's pre-tribulation. There is a problem with this argument here. The problem with this argument is, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This rapture is actually for the Christians here. It's not for the tribulation saints. Well, what's your proof text for that? The proof text is easy. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a what? Mystery. Mystery. Oh, that's good, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, here's your rapture. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Wait a minute. Uh, Jesus, Jesus said at Matthew 24, this is not a secret. This is not a mystery. Oh, Paul, later, after, after Jesus, after Jesus said that, Paul said, I'm going to give you a mystery. That wasn't revealed before. Right. Paul's a liar. If he's talking about the same rapture right. Jesus is talking about. Yeah. Paul's a liar then. Paul lied because Jesus sure talked about it. Then what is Paul talking about? He's talking, he must be talking about a different subject. Not this rapture in Matthew 24. Paul is not talking about Matthew 24 then. Right. There is no doubt about it. Paul cannot be talking about this. Otherwise, he'd be a liar. He said, I'm going to give you a mystery about the rapture that wasn't revealed before. If, these, if this was the same thing as 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul was talking about, he's a liar. Right. Right. He claimed this is something that wasn't revealed before. What does that mean then? This has to be separated from this. Right. This has to be separated from this. This is a separate rapture. How do you know that? Because 1 Corinthians 15 already told you there is a different raptures. The same chapter that Paul said it was a mystery. Yep. Right. Yep. See, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about that. So there's no way. By the way, isn't it contradictory? This is public, right? This is public, but this one is private. They contradict each other. How about that? There's no doubt that this is a totally separate topic when Paul talks about the rapture. It's not Matthew 24. There's no doubt about it. Now, there are other proofs why the Christian's rapture has to be separated from the tribulation here. And we have our own, which is going to take place before the tribulation. Let's look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And then we'll look at verse 9 through 10. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Now, the tribulation, you'll notice in that passage, the tribulation starts at Revelation chapter 6. Look at Revelation 6, 1 and 2. If you look at that, that's the first horseman. The Antichrist comes out. So the Antichrist starts. Revelation 6. So the tribulation begins in Revelation 6. But look what happens before. Before Revelation 6. Look at Revelation 5. 5. Notice there are Christians already up in heaven. Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou hast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So notice right here that these are Christians, right? Aren't we the ones that are kings, made kings and priests with God, and we will reign on the earth? So that's us. <laughs> Notice chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, we're already up in heaven. Is that what it shows? Christians up in heaven? So Christians are up in heaven, and then the tribulation starts here. See, what does that show? Christians aren't down here at the tribulations. They're up here. 
While the tribulation down there, they're separated from that. So notice that we see a pre-tribulation rapture where Christians have to be up there before the tribulation begins. Now, some people, what they would like to argue is, well, verse 9 and 10 is not the entire, uh, it's not the entire Christians right here. It's referring to 24 elders, they will call it. But the argument is easily debunked that it's not 24 elders. This is all the Christians. Because look at verse 9. The second part of verse 9 says, Hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of what? Every, Every kindred, kindred and tongue and people and nation. See, that's all the Christians around the world. Amen. And then look at verse 10. That's all the Christians. Made us unto our God kings and priests. Unless you want to argue it's only 24 Christians. So we see right here that it's referring to the entire Christians who are up in heaven. Um, uh, if you don't believe that, look at Revelation 1, 5, and 6. Revelation 1, 5, and 6. Let's start off with verse 6. Verse 6. Some people will argue, well, it's only Christians up in heaven, but there are other Christians down on earth. Um, the problem is this, is that these, this is referring to all Christians because look at verse 6, Revelation 1, 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that the same wording? Yeah. Okay. All right. Is this some Christians or all Christians? All. all. You don't want to believe it's all, then what are you going to do with verse 5? Five? 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Is that some Christians or all Christians? All. That's all Christians Jesus loved and washed away our sins with his blood. All Christians. And those all Christians are what? Verse 6. Made kings and priests unto God. Wait a minute, Revelation 5, 9 and 10, which we looked at, those Christians are made kings and priests. Is that some Christians or all Christians, you think? Okay. That's all. Unless you want to say Jesus Christ, you know, just decided to wash some with his own blood and only loved for some Christians, not all Christians. That don't make sense. This is all, say, believer, that he bled and died and washed away sins. So it's all, all, all are up there. Not some, or those who have gone before us, or something. No, it's all. It's all. By the context of Revelation 1. All Christians up here, then tribulation starts. What do you call that then? What do you call that? Christians are up in heaven before the tribulation starts. Hence, pre-tribulation rapture. They got caught up to heaven. If you don't think so, then when do they get caught up to heaven? When? When? Sometime in the tribulation or the middle. No. Your verse right here, Matthew 24, shows that's not for Christians. we already proven that. Then when? 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 Revelation 5 already showed you. You just don't want to admit it. Okay? You don't want to admit it. If you don't want to admit it, then be my guest, but then, wh then when are they going up to heaven? When are they caught up to heaven? Mm -hmm. Tell me when. When do they get raptured up? Sometime here, 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 here. No, Matthew 24 already showed you that cannot be the case. That's not us. All right. Here's another one. Uh, we're going to also look at Daniel, uh, Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. And verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 30. We'll look at verse 6. Now the tribulation for some people who've heard of this before. In Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 6, this is a verse talking about the tribulation. And the people know that. So they're going to know, realize that Jeremiah 30 verse 6 talks about the tribulation. Asking, verse 6 Asking now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that great, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. 
So notice right here that this passage is talking about the tribulation, but the, the verse already told you, it already told you who the tribulation belongs to. It doesn't belong to Christians. The tribulation belongs to who? It says Jacob's. That means mine. That means it belongs to me. All right? It doesn't say Christian's trouble. It's what? Jacob's trouble. See, it belongs to Israel. So notice right here that the tribulation is reserved for Israel. Well, I don't believe in that. Then you're going to have trouble again because that verse says it's mine, mine, Jacob's trouble. That means it belongs to me. It doesn't say Christian's. It doesn't say the church's trouble. It's Jacob's trouble. Why? Because Israel... They do have to go through the tribulation all the way to the end, and then Jesus Christ finally comes down at the end and rescues them from the Antichrist. Christians will teach the wrong doctrine that, hey, we're going to go through the tribulation, and in the end, Jesus Christ is going to come down for us. No. What's going to happen is, is that Jesus Christ comes down for the Jews. That's what's going to be. It's not the Christians, it's the Jews. Look at Daniel, uh, look at Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, notice right here at verse 25, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall see future. Sometime in the future, the nation of Israel, what? Shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from the church. Is that what it says? No. Turn ungodliness from what? Jacob. Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. See, God takes away Israel's sins. It's a national salvation here. A national salvation here. Saving the nation from its sins. Why? Because look at the nation of Israel. They forsake God right now. They're, they're a group of people that's so stubborn to get saved. This group of people. They reject Jesus Christ. So that's why the tribulation is for them. Why? So that sometime in the future, the Bible says that blindness is happened to Israel. But until God is done dealing with the Gentiles, right? Which is the world... Why? Because all the world follows the Antichrist. When God is done dealing with the world, then what happens? He come, the verse says he comes down for who? Jacob, Israel. Not for the church. Well, I think it's the church. You think it's the church? Then does verse 27 apply to you? My covenant when I shall take away their sins. You're telling me that God takes away your sins sometime in the future. Not right now. Right. Uh, don't make sense. I'll tell you what, he can save you right now. Take away your sin right now. All you have to do with the repentant and believing heart, confess to the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, you're saved right now. Yep. And once you get saved right now, it's done. But this one, the verse says, no, this group of people has to be the future. Right. Why? Because this, it's talking about Israel. Let's make it simple. It's not the church, it's Israel right here. Yes. Why? Because use common sense. Right now, Israel is a God-rejecting nation. They hate Jesus Christ. Yep. So then they have to undergo through this horrible time. Hence, it's called Jacob's trouble. And when they go through this antichrist hell on earth with the devil on their tail, that's what it takes to finally humble them. Right. Now look at Daniel 9. Daniel 9. This is way more convincing. Go to Daniel 9. You know where you get your idea of a seven-year tribulation? People talk about that the, there is a thing called the seven-year tribulation. Do you know where they get that verse from? There's only one verse. There's only one verse in your entire Bible. Their proof text for a seven-year tribulation, all right, is Daniel chapter 9 
and verse 27. That's the only passage that talks about a seven-year tribulation. There's no other verse. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So that's what they argue. Because they argue that uh, one week, which equals seven days, one day biblically represents one year. So they argue seven-year tribulation. So that's the only passage that uh, scholars will talk about a seven-year tribulation. Whether you believe you're going to go through the tribulation or there's a mid-trib rapture or it's a before the tribulation, whatever. The point is that's the only verse that all sides can find for a seven-year tribulation. Okay, if this is your only passage, who is this seven-year tribulation reserved for? Look at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Okay, notice right here that the Bible talks about that there is 70 weeks. Now follow along with me here. 70 weeks. In this 70 weeks, God says what? God says, if you look at verse uh, 25, if you look at verse 25, the Bible says, No, therefore understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. Okay, so basically it's saying right here that 69 weeks have already passed. This is referring to Jesus, Messiah. You see that right there? Messiah the Prince. So Dan Daniel, the book of Daniel is pointing out the 69 weeks already passed because the Messiah already came down, Jesus is already here. We know that, right? So the Bible calls that 69 weeks. So 69 weeks already passed. Well, how many is left over then? One more, right? So we need that one more week. That one more week is verse 27. See, that's why it says one week, which we read. So that one week, remember, what do they, what do those people believe a seven-year tribulation. What's the verse for that? It's that verse, 27, that one week. Remember that. Okay. So this is, this one week is the tribulation, right? We follow so far? All right. Go back to verse, so this is all 70 weeks total. Is that correct? Yes. 69, this one and this one is 70 weeks. Yes? Okay, 70 weeks is reserved for who? For who? Look at verse 24. 70 weeks are determined. So there, that's an appointed timeline upon the Christian church. The tribulation timeline is appointed for the Christian church. No. The verses are determined upon what Daniel's people, thy people, and upon thy holy city. That's Daniel's people. That's right. Daniel's holy city, Jerusalem. Yeah. There was no... Uh, you're talking about Christian church right over here. You think that the Christians were there that time? This is Jews right here, obviously. So then, well, I think it's referring to Christians, you know. Okay, Christians, how do you finish this off in verse 24? To finish the transgression. It takes you 70 weeks for Christians to finish the transgression, for God to fulfill the transgression. For and to make an end of sins. Oh, so our sins take 70 weeks long, the Christian church? Mm -hmm. And to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Really? I get righteousness 70 weeks long. It takes me 70 weeks until I get it? No. It's referring, don't forget, Romans 11, right. the nation of Israel. Because right. they reject God so many times. So then God put a time clock on them that it's going to take them this long until they fulfill that last week, right? The tribulation, once they fulfill that tribulation, then at the end, they get their sins forgiven. Remember that? And Romans 11, which we looked at? Yeah. Yeah. See, there is no doubt. This fits to a T. These verses has to, have to be only for Jews, the nation of Israel. It's not the Christian church. It's the nation of Israel. Do you get that? Well, no, it's the Christian church because we're the real Jew. Then it takes you 70 weeks long for you to get your righteousness. See, that don't make sense, bud. But it makes sense with this nation because they reject God. 
Unless you want to insist that you're the real Jew who yeah. rejects God. <laughs> that don't make sense. I'm a Christian because I don't reject God because I receive Christ yes, for my salvation. Yes. I receive God. <laughs> See, you have to divide. Dispensationalism, divide. Rightly divide. Why? You mesh the two together. Isn't it very confusing? Yes. That's why you have to rightly divide it. All right, go to 2 Thessalonians 2. All right, that's a good Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's the proof text from people that there is no pre-tribulation rapture. But I'm going to show you that out of this same proof text proves a pre-tribulation rapture. Just like Matthew 24 already proved that this rapture is not for Christians. It debunked the post-tribulation rapture right, for right. Christians. Their own proof text debunked it. I'm going to use their second proof text to debunk it too. All right? So notice that the scripture is very thorough. People just don't read and pay attention. But let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice right here that this is the passage to prove that Christians supposedly, that uh, we don't get a pre-tribulation rapture because if you look at verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So notice right here, this is talking about us gathering together with Christ mm -hmm. and his coming. Right. Okay, so let me put that over here, a separate box. So this is supposed to be the rapture. We can see here. Coming of Christ and gathering. Now we know right here that our gathering, see, us gathered together. That's pretty obvious. That's our rapture. God's gathering us together. Now, this is where they argue that our gathering or the rapture cannot be pre-trib or pre-tribulation because, verse 2, uh, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, so they call that the day of Christ. So both of these are called day of Christ. If both of these are called day of Christ, look what happens here. Uh, the verse keeps reading. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day... See, day of Christ, which is the rapture, right? It says, shall not come, right. except there come a falling away first. Okay, so there's already a falling away oh, yeah. right now. Yeah. So we know that. So the rapture can't happen until that. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. See, the Antichrist gets revealed. He gets shown, the Antichrist. Ah, oh, wait a minute. So then... Look at this chart. There seems to be a contradiction. The Antichrist starts here, right? He gets revealed. That verse seems to point out that we cannot have this day of Christ or the rapture start until we see him first. Right. Mm -hmm. See, so it seems like that, oh, we do go through the tribulation because we have to see him. Now, there are several arguments that's pretty easy to debunk this. Yeah. The reason why this is pretty easy to, to debunk is found in the following. Uh, oh, here's a second argument from them. In verse 2, here's another argument from our opponents. Don't let people deceive you that what in verse 2? The day of Christ is at hand. So in other words, that the rapture, if this is a rapture, that it can happen at any moment, basically. They believe, no, 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 it can't happen any moment. You have to go through the tribulation first to see the Antichrist, and then you get raptured. So those are their proof texts. Now, the reason why they are wrong about that is pretty simple. We go through several proof texts. The first one where we can cover is pointed out at Romans chapter 13, verse 11. All right, Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Romans 13, verse 11. No, it cannot be at hand. Well, uh, guess what? Paul says it is. Paul says that the rapture is at hand. They just didn't read it. Look at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And then we'll read verse 11. Verse 11. 
Notice that the Bible says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than we believe. Right? Verse 12, The night is far spent, the day, right? Just like 2 Thessalonians 2, the day. Paul said the day is not at hand, as 2 Thessalonians 2, but no, he said the day is what? At hand. at hand. Whoa, what in the world? He just contradicted himself. Well, the idea is pretty easy for some people who don't understand. Do you know what at hand means? Uh, I'll give you one example about at hand for some people who uh, haven't studied it before. If you um, look up the term at hand, you'll find out that there's one verse where at hand means two meanings. They don't know proper English. So it has two meanings. At hand means is like near any moment, okay? Any moment. But it also means already here. So when we go back to 2 Thessalonians, go back over there, 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, when Paul says right here, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, Paul is saying, Paul is not saying that don't let, Christ, don't let people deceive you that the rapture is any moment, because it's not. There's no such thing as the rapture happening any moment or imminent or pre-trib rapture. No, he's saying don't let people deceive you that the rapture is already right, here. Right. That's right. Why? Because people were worried that they missed out on the rapture. That's, right. That's why it makes sense why they Paul did. mentioned verse 3 and 4. Verse yes. 3. Look, you didn't pass the rapture. Why? Because you need these two things. You need the falling away and you need the antichrist. Right. See that? You need the falling away and you need the Antichrist. So that's what he means right here. If you don't believe it means already here, then I would beg to differ. What do you do about the passage at Samuel where one person said, here, I have at hand ten shekels. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? He's already holding the shekels. Yeah. It doesn't mean any moment now I'm going to have the shekels. Right. That don't make sense. Another passage. Uh, Jesus talk, talks about that the traitor is at hand. Mm -hmm. What did he mean by that? Right. He meant that the one who betrays him is already here. Right. He's here in the garden. So that's why we can see that this is what Paul means. And it fits well with the context of 2 Thessalonians 2. People were scared that they missed out on the rapture. Right. Right. So that's why Paul says, no, these two things have to happen. That's good, so that's yeah. the argument. Now here's another one is that it's not just the rapture Paul is talking about when it says day of Christ. Did you notice I wrote two things here? Mm -hmm. It's coming of Christ and our gathering. Right. Look at this chart. When did I mention about Christ coming down for Israel? Did I say, uh, when is he coming down? That's after, right? Yep. The coming of Christ. is after, and he comes down for Israel. Right. Yeah. But our rapture, which is our gathering, is before. The day is referring to what? It's referring to these two events. Wait, wait, that don't make sense. How can a day cover two different events? Because your day is not the same thing as God's day, right. all right? The Bible says a day with the Lord is what? A thousand, a thousand years. years. Why? So many different events can happen within one thousand years. Right. See, when God talks about his day, so many different events can happen. Notice right here that uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul is talking about two events here, not one. The coming of Christ is not the rapture here. How do you know it's not the rapture? That it's talking about him coming down at the end and Armageddon. Because, silly, just look at the verse, okay? Look at verse uh, 8, all right? And then shall that wicked be revealed. 
Wait a minute. Remember that the Bible says in verse 3, the Antichrist has to be revealed, right? right? Okay, when he gets revealed, okay, look at this one. This is second coming. This is not rapture, us rapture. This is second coming. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his what? Coming. coming. See? That's referring to this one, not right. our rapture, right. not our gathering. It's referring right. to Christ coming down, conquering his enemies. That's why the nation of Israel is nationally saved. Yep. From what? Romans 11 said Gentiles be fulfilled. See, the world going up against them. See, everything starts to fit and make sense. But uh, for some people uh, who didn't read the passage, uh, they didn't read, uh, look at verse, uh, let's see right here. From the Lord. Sec, uh, for 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, you'll notice right here in verse, uh, let's see right here, verse 7, verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in, with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Notice right here that 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 was already talking about the coming of Christ when he judges his right. enemies. Right. That's why later in chapter 2 when he talks about the day of Christ, see, he has this thing in mind. Right. He has this thing in mind. And that's why at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, he already points you out, see, the coming of Christ is right here. He's not talking about the rapture or the gathering of believers up in heaven. The coming of Christ is mentioned at uh, verse 8 as him judging the wicked right here. Right. Now, so we see that the day of Christ is these two events. But 2 Thessalonians 2 points out that we are not in the tribulation, that we are up with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Remember, the verse says, he judges those, in 2 Thessalonians 1, when he comes down, he judges those who obey not the gospel, right? Okay, look at this now. What if you're saved by the gospel? You're not down here when Christ comes down. When you get saved by the gospel, you're up here. Christians go up here when they get saved by the gospel. Okay, look at this passage. Go to uh, Keep your hand in 2 Thessalonians 2 and go to Colossians 3. 2 Thessalonians 2 and Colossians 3. Now, Notice that, okay, we're talking about the tribulation here. What does the Bible say? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse uh, 7, and then notice verse 8, verse 9, 10, 11, 12. That's all the tribulation, right? The Antichrist down there. If you look through all of that, that's talking about the Antichrist down there in the tribulation, right? right? Did you notice that Paul says, we, we, we there? No, he says who? They. He doesn't say we. Why? Because he's not in the tribulation. They. So he's saying other people. When we say they, we're talking about others, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we use the reference we, then we're talking about ourselves, right? Paul never said we when referring to the tribulation context. He's talking about other people will be there. Well, then what happens to we? He says after at verse 12, they, in the tribulation, verse 13, but we. Wait a minute, there's a contrast then. What happens to, what makes us, we, different from them? But what happens to us? But we are what? Bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen, to, chosen you to salvation 
through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Are you those Christians who got saved? Yes. yes. What happens to us? Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he called you to glory if you're saved by the gospel, right? Yeah. You're called to glory. What's that? That's up in heaven. Look at Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is, a, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him where? In glory. In glory. See, Christ raptures us yeah. up in glory with him. Amen. All right, so that's talking about Christ rapturing us, right? Okay, go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. There, that's no doubt going up to heaven. Right. So then, let me ask you this again. If you go to 2 Thessalonians 2, how can you prove Christians are going through the tribulation when Paul says that people in the tribulation in verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 is they, mm -hmm. which means other people, not us. And then he says, but we, so they will go through the tribulation, but we, what? Get caught up to glory. What does that mean then? That means that you are raptured up to heaven and you don't go through the tribulation then. It's that plain and simple. So notice right here at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 and 14. 14 said, called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Colossians chapter 3 says, When Christ shall appear, ye shall appear with him in glory. Okay? So that verse proves right there that this is referring to us going to heaven with him if you are saved in Jesus Christ. Okay, are you saved in Jesus Christ? Are you a Christian? Yes. Then sorry, this is not you. This is they. Yes. You, we, go up here. So that's, that's very much, very much strong evidence. Very, very strong evidence that tribulation is not for us, it's for them. Right. But we are what? Called to glory. We go to heaven with Jesus Christ. But uh, another, this is, the silliest, uh, this is the silliest argument. They'll argue right here that, well, the Bible says that we Christians must endure much tribulation and enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, that the tribulation is for Christians. Again, they don't de know definition, okay? They think that at hand is some kind of anti-pre-trip thing. They are thinking one definition. Study the definition. What does tribulation mean, okay? Tribulation simply means what? Hardship. Do Christians go hardship? Yes. yes. Right now? Yes. Right now we're going through tribulation. Why? Because it's called a hardship. It's that simple. That doesn't mean that we go through the seven-year tribulation where the Antichrist is. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you two proof texts. Go to Revelation 2, and then I want you to go to Matthew 24. Their own proof text, Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 24, and then Revelation chapter 2. Matthew 24. And Revelation chapter 2. Now, I have to uh, squeeze in the time because I don't have much time. No, uh, so I'm just going to uh, explain very briefly and quickly. Like I said, I had this could go five hours, right? So I'm trying to give the simplest ones as much as I can. If you still refuse to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture after this, then I'm very sorry. You have to be plainly ignorant or you haven't looked at your scripture. You haven't taken time to pray. You haven't taken time to study the argument. I'm not even telling you to believe what I'm saying. I'm begging and just asking you, look at the verses and study and see if what I explained to you was true or not. Right. Look at the verse and then interpret from that. Okay, look at Revelation. If you look at Revelation 2.10, if you think tribulation means the Antichrist mark of the B666, then how come Revelation 2.10 says tribulation is 10 days? Mm -hmm. That don't make sense. You think, uh, you think the Antichrist 666 is 10 days long? Unless it's talking about what? Hardship. It's that simple. Go to, go to Matthew 24. 
You know what Matthew 24 says? Matthew 24 says that this tribulation under the Antichrist is different from other tribulations we undergo. Oh, how about that? <laughs> Look at Matthew 24. Notice what the Bible says at verse 21. 21. 21. For then shall be great tribulation, what? Such as was not since the beginning of the world. See that verse is saying this tribulation is nothing like other tribulations before. That's why it says great tribulation, right? So notice right here that Matthew 24 even admitted, yeah, there are multiple meanings of tribulation. Because why? This tribulation is unlike any other tribulation before. All right. People will argue that uh, the pre-tribulation rapture is a, or dispensationalism is a creation by Jesuits or by John Nelson Darby or by C.I. Schofield, whatever, okay? But this, uh, no, there is, that is not true. One is, it's scripture, okay? The apostles, they're greater than any other testament and evidence. Right. Secondly, there are historical evidences that long before Darby, Schofield, and Jesuits, that there were people teaching about this rapture before the tribulation and dispensationalism. You got uh, Irenaeus at the second century who says, and therefore, when in the end, the church shall be suddenly cut up from this. Yeah. It is says there shall be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous in which when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. That's Irenaeus against heresies 5.29. So notice that the church suddenly gets caught up from all this tribulation and chaos happening. Ephraim in the 4th century, in his quote, On the Last Times, quote, See to it that this sentence be not fulfilled among you of the prophet who declares, Woe to those who desire to see the day of the Lord. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. Uh, Here's another one from the Apostolic Brethren in 13, 14 centuries. And you can find this in the history of Brother Dulcino in Francis X in Gummerlach's article, A Rapture Citation in the 14th Century, Bibliotheca Sacra. This is, the quote is, Antichrist was coming into this world. After he had come, the brethren would be, which is the brethren, would be transferred into paradise in which are Enoch and Elijah, and in this way, they will be preserved unharmed from the persecution of Antichrist. See that? They get rescued. They get saved, preserved from the persecution of the Antichrist. They get raptured to heaven. But uh, I, uh, you can look up the book. It's called Dispensationalism Before Darby. There's a, it's, a, it's a plain title. Yeah. For people who think Darby created, they weren't looking carefully. If you typed out Darby Dispensationalism, you should have found that book. It's called Dispensationalism Before Darby. It's a scholastic book, too, and it points out too many historical works and references. There's also another book called Ancient Dispensationalism as well, going to ancient sources. There's just way too much evidence. But by the way, I didn't give you all these quotes from Dennis Van Leeuwen in 15th century, Richard Roach in 1727, and then other church, other early writings and church fathers, Barnabas in CA 100 to 105, Pius from 60 to 130 AD, Justin Martyr to 110 to 195 AD, Irenaeus 122 to 202, which I read, Tertullian to 145 to 220, Hippolytus from 185 to 236, Cyprian to 200 to 250, and Lactantius in 260 to 330. Don't tell me I don't do my homework, guys, in dispensationalism and pre-tribulation rapture. Don't tell me that, buddy. Glory God. But let me give you a more powerful proof. Jesus and Paul teach it. All right? Let's look at the passages, okay? I'm going to give the I'm going to give that one and then we'll call it an hour. I know I'm over time, but like I said, this is number one video proof and I want to blow your minds away and make it very 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 clear, okay? So you can't if you don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, you have to admit you are plainly denying scriptural evidence. Plain, easy, plain as a nose on your face scriptural evidence. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 2. 
And then Luke 21. Luke 21, Luke 21, and 1 Thessalonians 5, excuse me. Luke 21 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Luke 21 and 1 Thessalonians 5. You notice right here, I went by their very own proof text. Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, every reference to tribulation. And I automatically debunked them in their very own proof text. I've given overload of historical evidences. I've also given you way, uh, way more scriptural evidences than historical evidences. And, then let, and I've given you tons of verse, point after point after point. I've shown you that you have to divide. There is no doubt about it. That this rapture for the tribulation is definitely not for the Christian church. I gave you verses proving that there are multiple raptures. And then let me just conclude it off with Jesus and Paul showing that uh, we have to be raptured before the tribulation. That we're not there. Okay? Whew. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Okay. Notice right here. That uh, when we're talking about our rapture, so that's what's referring to the catching up, snatching up, right? Thief. Mm -hmm. See that right there? Again, matching up with the meaning of rapture. Okay, so this day of the Lord, it's mentioned right over here, and then they talked about <coughs> so come as at the thief in the night. If we were to say that this is referring to the rapture, then look at this, okay? This is gonna. This is going to be chilling to our opponents, cool. if that's referring to the rapture. You'll notice right here, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden uh, look, verse 4, excuse me. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Okay, so this is something, that verse says you're not overtaken unawares. Is that true? Okay. Ugh, I have no room. One, when you get this rapture, you're not overtaken unawares. Right. Second, look at verse 7. Uh, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Okay, notice right here, you're not drunken in the night, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, next one, uh, verse 7, uh, we, we already read that, excuse me, 9 and 10. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Okay, so this verse shows that whether we are alive or we're dead, we're going to be living up together with Jesus Christ. Well, that's plainly rapture. I don't know how you say that. Okay, so this is no doubt the rapture, but this rapture is what? Not part of the wrath. The appointment right. is not wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. Okay. Right. Now, let me tell you this, is that why aren't we not going to the tribulation? Because the tribulation is a time of God's wrath on yes. the earth, yes. and we're, this, we're not appointed to this time. That's right. Now, some will argue, well, no, the wrath is referring to this one little day event that's at the end of the tribulation. Because it says day of wrath. Maybe that's why. But remember, they don't know their scripture. A day with the Lord is a what? A thousand years and a thousand years to one day. Multiple events can happen in day of wrath, which is not a 24-hour period. Okay? Multiple events happen. That's scriptural. We've proven that. Besides, I don't know what you're going to do with one week right here with the tribulation. With, when they know that seven years, okay? So we know that this is not 24-hour day period here in the biblical calendar term, okay? But let's just, uh, let's just assume they're right, that this is at the end. I don't know what you're going to do with this case when you go to Luke 21. Luke 21 and verse 21. Luke 21, 21. This is the tribulation. Then let them which are in Judea, oh Jews, not Christians, right? Uh, Flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them there in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of what? Vengeance. Wait a minute. This passage about the tribulation, by the way, 
You can compare that with Matthew 24. It's repeating the same thing on Matthew 24, your proof text for tribulation. Mm -hmm. So this is about the tribulation. The Bible calls it days of what? Vengeance. I thought you said this is not the days of wrath. Yeah. I thought it was one little thing at the end. No, the Bible says this entire tribulation period is days of wrath. Well, it said vengeance, not wrath. Keep reading. Verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. See, it's a long time. For there shall be great distress in the land, and what? Wrath. Yeah. Wrath upon this people. Yes! Yes, and that's why it makes sense. It's for Jews. Because that's what it takes to finally humble them. When they see all this wrath of God and then the sheer hell of the Antichrist, then obviously they're going to fall on their knees after that. Right, right. And that's why it takes them 70 weeks throughout that whole time period for them to finally get saved after that and open their eyes to the truth. So see, this makes it... How can you say Christian church? It makes it more confusing. Right. How are you going to fit everything with the Jews through their 70 weeks, national salvation... And then tribulation for Jews that are mentioned so many times. By the way, Revelation 7 gave you 12 tribes of Israel there too. Revelation 7 about the tribulation. Right. This is all Jew, Jew, Jew. Appointed to Jews. We're not appointed to the tribulation wrath. But Daniel 9 says, the tribulation is appointed for who? Thy people, Jews. Now, look, this is... I, I, if you deny this teaching... You're going to break all this scripture apart. Mm -hmm. This is way total evidence. But keep reading down. Let's look at verse 34. 34. 34. The Bible says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any times your hearts be overcharged with serving. And what? Drunkenness. Drunkenness. Look at this. See? Drunken and night. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. And cares of this life, so that they come upon you, what? Unawares. Remember, we're not overtaken unawares? Yep. Remember that? Mm -hmm. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. That matches with 1 Thessalonians 5, which we read. But look at this. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to what? Escape. Escape. All these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Look at that. You, the verse says all these things about the tribulation, you escape it. You escape it. That's what that verse says. You escape it. Well, how do we know we're the ones counted worthy that escape it? Simple. If you're not that category at verse 34, you're drunken in the night, overtaken unawares. What the 1 Thessalonians 5 says. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, We are not those who are overtaken unawares and those drunken in the night. Yeah. He said that, 1 Thessalonians 5. Yep. So, wow. Then, so since we're the ones that already are not a part of this category, we're accounted as the ones already worthy to escape all these things. Mm -hmm. So guess what? Jesus said that at Luke. And then Paul followed up with that, 1 Thessalonians 5, if you compare the wordings there, which we already read. So both Jesus and Paul told you, and they knew in their head, we're not going to go through the tribulation then. See, we're not like those people who go through the tribulation, the wrath, drunken in the night, overtaking on the words. No, we're the ones who escape. We're not part of that category. We're a different group. We escape all those things. Okay, that should be way more than evidence. So, like I told you... Uh, the pre-tribulation rapture is true. Dispensationalism is true. You can look at our playlist if you want way more evidence after that. And stop watching these channels that keep deceiving you. All right? If you keep watching these videos, then you're going to keep getting deceived, okay? And go retread back into wrong doctrine again. I hope your mind got clear. Amen. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has truly opened the eyes of the people and helped them to seek after right doctrine, not wrong doctrine, and that we get our doctrine straight. Doctrine is important to you because you said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. You put that first, and then you put reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. 
I pray that this teaching will help out the people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.